Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to The Take Up. Today we have episode 50, Applicate Any Way, Applied Materials with Any Tools. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Take Up. It is Friday, again, 2.30 p.m. in the mountain time zone where I am, but in many other time zones, it is many other times, and I'm happy to have you whatever time it is for you. We're here to talk today about applique. We've got kind of a loose show today. There's a lot that I want to talk about, but I know that applique is a huge topic, and I'm going to really only be able to get to some introductory stuff. So hopefully I'll be able to get to enough. You'll see that we do have a lot of links today. If you check out the links list, we already have that up in the comments, whether you're on YouTube or on Facebook. But if you didn't catch that, here it is on screen for anybody who is catching on the replay or wants to write that down. Hopefully that is short enough. I, once again, I'm looking for a better links list app. If anybody has any suggestions, please hit me up in the comments or contact me later. I would love to have something a little more robust than what we have now. But for now, this at least lets you get to all the different things I'm talking about. Now, once again, there are a ton of resources in the links list. Not all of them are directly about applique. Some of them just show some images that I'd like to discuss today about the kinds of applique I've done. But what I am going to cop to is the fact that applique was not necessarily my primary mode of business. And I'm coming to this from the point of view of a small to medium company that didn't do a ton of applique. So some of the stuff I'm talking about is more about how applique fit into our existing embroidery business that didn't have a ton of applique focus and how you can handle it even if you don't have a ton of equipment. So let's go ahead and go to the comments real quick, see who is here today. And uh, first and foremost, we've got Christine Shree saying, happy Friday, Eric. Happy Education Friday to you, Christine. Happy to have you here and happy to see everybody joining in. Uh, episode 50, <laughs> Aaron Montgomery today on the uh, Two Other Guys podcast. If you didn't see earlier, I was on the Two Other Guys podcast doing my list of five things that will help you stop suffering when you're first learning digitize for embroidery. But he actually discussed and, and said a very nice thing. He said, hey, thank you for the consistency and the content. Cool to see episode 50. I'll celebrate when we hit 52. That'll be a year's worth of content. And that's happening in two episodes. So two more episodes, we'll see. Maybe I'll have to run some sort of something. We'll, we'll find out. I'll have to give something away. I don't know what. <laughs> and we'll find out how that works. Probably some files, probably something fun, probably something educational. But we'll figure that out as we go. I'll have to admit, it's something that uh, you just put one foot in front of the other and you keep going. You don't really think much about it. And Aaron Montgomery, actually here today, my, my man, I don't know if you want to get in this technical application stuff, but we'll see. It should be pretty introductory. Hopefully it's a fun thing and not just me getting crazy on uh, embroidery. But he says... Wahoo, I get to be a hashtag reciprocator today. Thank you, reciprocators, for being here. Uh, and so thank you, Aaron, for being one of the reciprocators, one of the people who is joining in. Uh, Tom Farr, Buzzers Bay Embroidery. Hi, everyone. Hi, Tom. Happy to have you here. Uh, Greg Johnson's coming in from Boston. Old Viking. Love that logo. Love Viking stuff if you haven't seen that before. And yeah, Christine, thank you. Thank you very much. Justin Armenta, digitizer himself, also from MNerd. If you haven't checked out what's happening on the Embroidery Nerd group, he's out there. Good at Friday Reciprocators. Uh, we've got a lot of people joining in. I've got to say, Frank Dunn coming in. Uh, good evening from across the pond, Frank. <laughs> and greetings from Bulgaria. Darren, thank you for coming in. And yeah, aptly, yay. I love applique. Like I said, when I get to use it, I have always loved it. It's not always something to do. Yeah, Linktree might be an option for links. Thank you, Aaron. Let's see. Hello from South Carolina. I'm assuming Brianna. Hello, everyone. And Eric. Hello, Brianna. Michael Downey, name of the reciprocators. Hello, Mike. How is everyone? Everyone hopefully doing well. I know it's been a heck of a week for me, and I will admit to being a little scattered after having some uh, personal stuff I had to go through and some uh, health stuff with my family and things like that that have been weighing on my mind. But, you know, that's a lot of people these days. So, you know, take, take care and realize everybody's going through an uphill battle right now. All right, greens from South Carolina, experimenting leather, textured vinyl, other exotic fabric applique, adding clear vinyl on top or clear vinyl. Anything is really wild stuff. That's great. I love to see that stuff. I have seen some awesome stuff. I'm going to show you a little bit from a guy named RJ Silva out in Arizona who does a lot of things very much like that. One of the things I really love, Mexican serape fabric with clear vinyl over the top. Really cool look, really cool look, and I enjoy it. So really love that stuff. Carolyn, awesome stricken knits embroidery. I've used some pretty weird stuff for applique. I love weird applique. And the great thing about applique is though we think of it as the classic tackle twill, and we're going to talk more about that, classic polyester twill applique, anything can be an applied material done correctly. Applique can be a lot of different things. And I've actually used a lot of weird material, and I may show you a little bit of that myself, because honestly, weird material is great for adding texture and adding value. 
So that's awesome. Yeah, Mike says, congrats on 50. Thank you, Mike. Dolores, hello from Michigan. Hello, Dolores. Happy to have you in. <laughs> I need a cake for 52. The last thing I need is cake, Christine. Uh, very much don't need cake. Uh, what I need is to abscond from, <laughs> from here and start exercising a little bit more. Uh, Regina coming in saying, hi, Regina has done some awesome applique stuff and she's used it in interesting ways. She did some really cool giant monograms that looked very, uh, very heavily covered, but were light, light fills on top of monograms on light materials for wedding stuff. Really cool way to handle uh, trying to get a coverage on a large area is using a, an applique with a really light fill on top. And something else we'll talk about today too. It's pretty good stuff. <laughs> so... Aaron about episode 52. Oh, I know you can give away some content. Wait, you were doing that. I am giving away content every day. It's what I want to do. Curtis says hello from Kansas. Wade says hi, Eric. Hello, Wade. Uh, Lori says hello from New Hampshire. Jeff, Jeff Fuller of MNerd as well, digitizer himself, says hello. Looking forward to it. Absolutely. You know, introductory stuff. You may not need it if you're a digitizer who's been around for some time. However, talking about applique, talking about the different things we can do and how it's been used, because I'm going to talk about what I did with it as far as business, as far as how I serve customers with it. That's also interesting stuff too. Oh, from Santa Fe, New Mexico, Marianne, I've seen your work several times and thank you from MAS Embroidery from New Mexico, my home state. If you didn't know, I'm in Albuquerque, New Mexico right now, everybody. And let's see what else we have going on. We've got, <laughs> Aaron says, great idea. I'll send him a confetti cannon. I'm not cleaning up confetti all over my, <laughs> my office. If you guys don't know, two regular guys, we have a, had a couple times confetti cannons on. A uh, real great guy came on. And I, I just forgot his last name. Pete came on and showed us celebration and said, you know, most people, the last time they got really celebrated was the graduation from high school or graduation from college and nobody gets celebrated. And so we've taken it upon ourselves to celebrate milestones for people. And so the confetti cannon is one of those things Aaron does. I don't feel like backing me all up, <laughs> and especially don't want it in my embroidery room. <laughs> but let's see here, guys. Um, we have lots of cool stuff going on here. And I will just say, Lisa Shaw, also here, incredible digitizer and creator. And I know she will say she's not a digitizer. She makes lots of great stuff. So yes, she is. Uh, my, my compatriot over in Brilliance and uh, does incredible work in her own teaching as well. So go check out her content while you're out there. Gloria says hi from Tennessee. And then let's go ahead and with that, we were talking about cool embroidery stuff. We're talking, oh, Pete Loveless. There we are. Thank you. Pete Loveless introduced us to the Convetti Cannon. Uh, Booster Sportswear, I believe, is his, his uh, company. But Pete, awesome guy. And yeah, celebrate everything. So with all of that, that was a flurry of people who I just went through a flurry of stuff. I like to do the introductions and talk to everybody. So, you know, it's something that I like to do. I like to acknowledge everybody who comes here. Uh, if you come here live, not only can we talk about your business, confetti, cannons, cakes, and the rest, you can ask questions. So if you're not catching this live, you're catching this on the replay, please show up live 2.30 p.m. Mountain on Friday afternoons. Uh, really great to have you in and we can have question and answer. And what I'm really hoping for while we're all here today, if you have ways that you've used applique, if you wanna talk about the different things that uh, are interesting to you with applique, what you don't know, what you do know, what you'd like to do, uh, you wanna ask questions, you wanna give some context to how you use it, jump in the comments and do that. Love to have live Q&A, love to have live discussions. So uh, with that, we'll go ahead and see if I can bring in some of this content. Like I said, there's a lot of stuff to talk about today. So we're just gonna kind of touch on applique. We're gonna touch a little bit on what applique is, what uh, it's traditionally used for, and I'm gonna touch about a little bit on, truthfully, some of the stuff I know and I don't know. Because like I said, I came from a company where applique was used, but not constantly used. And I wanna say hi to one more person who showed up, one of my favorite people who was on here, uh, Joe Rita who has taken upon herself to learn digitizing, doing a great job. Hello, Jerry, happy to have you here and glad it's a beautiful day in Austin, Texas. Love that town, really great place to go. All right, with that, let's go ahead and bring up the second screen. Uh, first thing I'm gonna show you just quickly is just remind you guys, the links list is there. If you haven't seen the link before, I'll pop this banner back up one more time. Uh, this is the current links list for today. As you'll see, there's the applique anyway post that I'm kind of taking some of my hints from on this. It's got a great article that goes with it. It's an older article, but it does cover some of the bases that we wanna talk about as far as applique is concerned. Uh, some of these things, like I said, this links list doesn't do great at previewing. I've got some articles from Images Magazine out in the UK where I talk about uh, non-traditional applique like uh, glitter flight printing and film. Uh, I talk a little bit about uh, multimedia and different appliques we did there. 
And then there are just examples of some of the cool stuff that I want to share as far as applicate work. So we're going to talk about all this stuff as we go through. But if you want to check out that links list, it is there at the link. You can grab any of those articles. Some of them are interesting for other reasons, talking about things like how to deal with mistakes in embroidery, how to handle applique, how to handle uh, multimedia, and what it's good for. So there's some cool stuff there for you to look at, certainly. And that's uh, all on the links list for you. But let's start talking about applique in general, right? Applique, as we know, it is applied material. The classic way to use applique is to create a filled area in an embroidered piece. It could be anything from a background, a large filled area or block to a letter, classic, classic applique usage, big collegiate letters, also smaller letters on the back of jerseys. Jerseys are a big one hockey jerseys, football jerseys, whatever. When we're talking about applique, you cannot get away from the idea of the classic cut tackle twill with a light zigzag outline. Uh, that's really frequently what you see classic applique being used for. Now, the truth of the matter is there's also kind of the home and craft market. Home and craft market applique is often a different thing where, yes, it is. It tends to go toward a letter, a number, something like that, or an object, but they tend to have more uh, patterns, more printed materials, more stuff like that. Whereas when you're seeing it in the commercial space, a lot of it, tons of it is just standard tackle twill. It is polyester twill of one form or another, usually in a solid color. Sometimes there's textured stuff, sometimes there's print, sometimes there's other stuff that's involved. But in general, in the commercial world, when you hear applique, the first thing people are thinking of is classic polyester twill solid colors may or may not have any stitching detail on top of it. That's applique. Now, the other thing I would love to bring up as far as applique in general, is that there are other types of applique that are not exactly the same as, the, as an applied material the way you would talk about it. And the, the one big one here is gonna be reverse applique. And hopefully I'll bring up a sample for that. Unfortunately, for some reason, the link I had for my sample disappeared on this guy. I may try and search this as we're working to show you a reverse applique. But a reverse applique, in essence, without going too far into it, reverse applique just means that we're going to apply a material to the back layer of a garment of the top layer, whatever the heck we're working on. And we're going to cut out the garment itself and the applique is on the reverse side and showing through. Now there's multiple ways we can handle that. And a lot of people doing great stuff uh, combining that with like sublimated prints, things like that. For me, I've done some, actually some handwork and, it, and it's not necessarily the, uh, most economical. We'll talk about that a little bit too, about how when you're doing handwork, you have to worry a little bit about the economy and the scale of the things you're working on. Um, but the truth of the matter is all applique is within your reach, even though it may not be within production, <laughs> within the, the realm of production at the normal cost you might see. If you're doing small run applique, if you're doing things without additional tools that make it easier, you may find that you have to charge an awful lot to make it work out. The thing is that anyone can still do sampling and exploration without really investing in a lot of equipment. I mean, equipment is great. And frankly, having some equipment is, I think necessary if you're gonna pursue applique to any great degree commercially, I would say that you at least have to have some kind of cutting equipment. Uh, um, doing hand cut appliques, I think it becomes very tired very quickly unless you're doing boutique work that is specifically using materials that don't do well with cutters, that don't do well with equipment. Uh, or if you're just doing very small, small runs and in individual pieces where, wherein uh, that kind of attention is paid for. When you're doing something that's one off that someone can pay for, there's a good chance that you may be able to make this financially viable. It doesn't always work when we're doing classic stuff. I mean, the truth of the matter is some stuff just isn't going to work like that. And, you know, I I would like to say that hand cut applique is always the way to go or there's always an option. It's an option for testing. It's not always an option for everything. So with that, let's go ahead and jump in to some of the stuff I have over here. I'll have to try and get that sample of reverse applique up for you later. But the first stuff I'm going to show you is just to talk a little bit about equipment. Um, you can have incredible equipment to do applique. And honestly, um, there's people out there, people who are in our comments right now who use, say, desktop laser units. They use lasers to do applique cutting. And it's really conventionally done now. Quite fr frankly, you'll find that those regular bed lasers pretty much all over the place. That's something that's fairly common. It is not as uncommon as it was when I was first working. When I was first working and the lasers were even more expensive than they are now, maybe twice what they are now, um, you didn't see a lot of really small shops running lasers to cut applique. Now, this is like the, the upper end of that, having a laser bridge where you have essentially a mounted laser of some kind that is passing over or in conjunction with your embroidery machine and is actually cutting at the station. 
you can do incredible stuff with these, including like kiss cuts where you have two layers of applique, you're cutting through one layer of applique, you're dropping it on, and you're doing this all in the hoop. And also you can do things like reverse cut applique in the hoop where we're applying a material, stitching it to the top material, and we're cutting away the top layer of the garment in the hoop while we're doing the embroidery without having to move that thing around. Laser bridges are super cool, but not necessary to do any applique. It's just great when you're doing a lot of sampling of large applique pieces. If you're doing a lot of sampling or you're doing a lot of production, you may wanna have something like this, or you can have a dedicated station which will accept an embroidery hoop. You pull things off of the embroidery process midway after you've say stitched things on or layered them, you clip them into an indexed hoop carrier in a laser system and have it cut it. Um, Super great, super useful. Not the only way to do this, right? Not the only way to do this. Uh, one of the other things we see a lot more of, and especially if you've uh, followed Vitor, if you see Vitor is online, he has been showing a lot of this, which is awesome piece from ZSK. And this is a hot cutting tool. A uh, hot cutting tool essentially has like a jet of hot air that is attached to the head of your machine. And what we do is we're essentially offsetting the needle so that we can essentially cut in the hoop with the hot end. And this is done you know, essentially in the hoop, it's not like the laser bridge though, it's on an individual head. It is, like I said, using essentially a stitch pattern that is offset from the needle so that we can go ahead and ad address that area with that hot cutter. Um, different kind of thing, it's not a laser cutter, doesn't have exactly the same usages, but it is really expensive. A lot of these things are quite expensive. Um, so it's something that you're not always going to see, right? It's not something you're gonna see everybody do. But as you can see here, um, when we have material that will hot cut when you have like um, artificial stuff like polyesters, it can be uh, cut with these torn materials quite easily. And honestly, very cool. It enables us to do multimedia really easily. It enables us to do some stuff that might be uh, quite difficult to, uh, to do by hand. However, it's not the only way to do applique. So what I wanna say is for people who are commercially looking at it and saying, these are my only options. These are definitely not your only options. These kind of things make things much easier. They certainly can give you a kind of scale that you might not have if you were doing it by hand, but it doesn't mean you can't employ applique. It doesn't mean you can't use it at all. In fact, I'm going to briefly talk about how I usually did applique and really it's uh, not done with these. Uh, when I did applique, it was done on a classic plotter cutter right? Plotter cutters. Now everybody knows what a plotter cutter is. These days you might not call it that anymore. What most people are thinking about is a cricket. You know, a cricket is a plotter cutter. But for me, of course, they were more commercial plotter cutters. And the thing I'd like to show you if I can, like I said, I've had so many things here that you might not see all the same stuff. And we'll, we're going to do our moment of meme in a minute to get back to this. But here is me making patches and I was actually doing a plotter cutter. And what I'm going to tell you is most of my career, I used an ancient Roland cam uh, cam cutter. And this thing ran off of a parallel port. You can see it up here in the corner. Uh, and essentially all you have to know about this is this is just a blade that swivels and it is being run like any other vinyl cutter, like any other piece. And honestly, um, it just isn't that hard to do, especially for single color, normal pieces of CAD cut twill, it's not that hard to handle on a plotter cutter. And what I'll even say is, if we're dealing with things like the island, and I'll see if I can show you this, this is more like a, a commercial system that is similar to what a Cricut has, where you have a tray where you can stick down materials. It makes it a lot easier to handle uh, materials that are not made for this. The thing is, with a standard plotter cutter, with the kind that we use, uh, in a the kind that we would use for sign vinyl, the kind that you would use for other kinds of uh, applied materials, you can cut this stuff. And what I've always used, and I'm just gonna show you literally the kind I use. This is not an advertisement for stalls. Other people have it, but this is what I used when I was doing most of my appliques. Stalls pressure sensitive poly twill. This stuff was used for a lot of my patchwork and a t like just about all of the work I did for applique. And the reason why I use this, it's pressure sensitive, it's on a roll, it's roll fed, and it has a backing layer, a clear film backing layer, so that I can throw it through a roller without a glue tray and cut it. Now, what I'm going to say is, you get better results in my opinion. I've seen better results when you're having dimensional problems, having things hang up sometimes on the glue tray. Plus, if you're going to cut things that don't have these kinds of you know, backing attached to them, they don't have a layer, a carrier sheet attached to them like this roll material is, then you're going to have to use some sort of roll material or glue tray. And I will say there was a thing called magic mask that we used, which is essentially a sticky backer that was like what comes on the polyester, poly, uh, the pro polyester twill like this, this pressure sensitive twill. That backer applied to materials, 
I had a heck of a time with it. Was it able to be done? Yes, it was. It didn't work for everything. And I much I would have much rather had a glue tray system, an adhesive tray. And what I'll say is, first, we'll go ahead and talk talk about a couple comments that we have here real, real fast. Um, Let's go ahead and bring in Mike and say, uh, commercial applique equipment is expensive, but I've successfully done two layer tackle tool applique with a Cricut, no lie. The next step after scissors really isn't that far away. And I'm going to agree, um, especially when we're talking about polyester twill like that, it is thin, it's crisp, it is made to be cut with a, with a blade like that. Uh, especially if you're getting the right materials, it's not that hard to do multicolored uh, pieces. And I'll show you a couple of multicolored pieces that I did using, like I said, an ancient rebuilt vinyl sign cut of the runoff parallel port. And it was so old that even that thing was older than the other parallel port machines we had in the building. I rebuilt one that I found in a closet and set it up specifically with all of my pressures and my overcut and everything else made specifically for applique rather than running it on our main cutter. So I kept our sign cutter clean and I took the eldest sign cutter we had somewhere in a closet, rebuilt it, cleaned it up, put a new cutting strip under it, got new blades for it, had a nice aggressive 60 degree blade. That's all it really was. Nothing else special than that. Just a rotating blade hand a holder, just like it usually would be 60 degree blade played with my downforce played with the oversteer, which is stuff. If you haven't run a cutter, you might not know, but it's stuff that you can play with kind of how far do we cut past the line that the vector shows that so that we get a clean cut and a clean corner. And I, I set up that cutter to always be set up for applique. So that's one of the things that I did. And I just said, yeah, my cutter runs off a of parallel port. I ran that thing for decades. No lie, decades until I had to run it off of a USB to parallel port converter and then eventually died and I got a lovely graph tech. Once again, didn't get a tray system, but we were doing other kinds of stuff. We we're doing a lot of sign vinyl stuff like that. And it made sense to me to keep a small compact piece where I could run sign vinyl and everything else off of it. However, like I said, Tons of applique. The applique I did, I did end up working on it. I will say, if I were to do it again today, I would want a laser. But if you can't afford the laser, applique is still within your reach. And I did commercial work that we got paid for and made a lot of profit on entirely off the plotter cutter. So it's not that you can't do it. So yeah, and I'll say this, um, Mike tones in. I've heard this a lot from the ILINE 300 that I just showed you with that adhesive tray. Uh, Mike says he loves his ILINE, one of his favorite uh, pieces of support equipment. Whichever equipment it is, a lot of people will have cutters that they love, and I've heard a lot of good things about that cutter. But I will say, if you're doing materials that aren't pre-made for applique, uh, having something with that adhesive tray, you know, better to work on that stuff. So it's one of those things that's, you know, love to have a laser for sure, but still absolutely something that can be done with a plotter cutter. And frankly, if you just want to test out applique, if you want to make samples to show a client, you don't need more than your embroidery machine and a scissor. And not always even a specialty scissor. Now, I, everybody will talk about specialty scissors and I'll show a couple. But a scissor or a, a scissor or a blade, a trimmer, a fabric trimmer in a pinch is a fine enough tool to cut applique even with fine details. I've done it many times. So that is one of those things you can make samples without getting into the full thing. And the other thing is companies like Stalls, I just showed you Stalls on that, on that right? I showed you the Stalls PS Poly 12. There are companies like Stalls and Stalls included that will cut from your vector files. They will cut from your files the piece you need. There are people to which you can go ahead and get cuts. And in fact, some of them will even produce the, the digitized files. They'll produce stitch files for their cuts. If you want to get into applique, the embroidery machine is really all you need. But even if you just want to do sampling yourself, that's something that you do is <laughs> that's something that you do. Uh, in-house that you can do with anything from a scissor on up. So let's go ahead and jump in and talk to a couple other people here. And uh, Frank says, brother, scan and cut. Yeah, some people are really into the scan and cut. Um, just depends. Like I said, I'm not here to advocate for a machine. I will say I used a lot of Roland machines and graph tech machines and loved them. But, uh, and an aisle line, actually. I used an aisle line machine too. So really, honestly, the cutters, the cutters have good technology. You can work on them. And for me, I've been able to make just about any cutter do what I want. I don't want to tell you that. All you brand guys, I'm sorry. I've made every cutter do what I want with a little bit of work. <laughs> so Jeff says, I ended up getting a laser, love it for cutting fabric. I agree. And Jeff, I know that you cut patches and you do some post cutting on patches with your laser. And I think sometimes for precision and for repeatability, uh, laser is great. And I've seen people do really great kiss cut work. Like I said, kiss cut is where you have the two layers or multiple layers stacked and you only cut the top layer off. I've seen some people do some really cool kiss cut work with lasers that I think would be a lot harder to do. And then you end up just weeding it like you would vinyl, taking out the pieces you don't need. And it's something that is interesting to look at. Like I said, I almost like, 
like Lisa here who says this. Uh, so tempted, but not sure I can justify it. Love the toys you have available. Yeah, I would love to have a laser. If I had a laser in house, I'd be pretty happy with that. But it's something that I don't know that I can justify, especially because in Brilliance has some applicant features. I'm going to show you one thing. Like I said, don't like to do brand specific things, but I do like to show you fun stuff in our software that other people don't seem to have. Um, I having cutters is really nice and useful to have around. So uh, Mike says, if I hadn't scored an eye line, I would have gone laser. They're slower, but opens up a few other opportunities. I, and I'll agree. Here's the thing about laser. Laser does seal edges on things like polyester. Whereas uh, the cutter does cut fairly cleanly. If your blades are clean, does do all right, but you can still get fringing. You can still get some issues even on a regular polyester twill uh, when you're just cutting with a blade. So the laser is going to melt those edges a bit. That's going to be a better look for a lot of folks. And if you're doing a loose zigzag, if you're doing loose outside edge zigzag and you are not doing, um, you know, full coverage satin stitch on the edge, you're not doing something like that, having a sealed edge can make a difference for you. I mean, a lot of us, we're going to be heat pressing that on. We're going to be using heat and pressure and the adhesive that's on that twill to permanently adhere it. But you might still have a little fringing, a little edge quality stuff with uh, blades. So lasers can certainly help with that. So it really just depends. Uh, Mike says, the best tool is the one you have, LOL. Here's what I'll say about that. And and yes, Jeff, I did laugh when I saw that come through. Um, it is one of those things that, that essentially shouldn't limit you. But there is truth to the idea that if you don't have a tool that's going to make it fast enough for production, you're going to have to balance how much something costs in your production time and the effort you put in to what you can get back out of it price-wise or how you can get that value sold and you have to work on that. So for me, it's like this. The laser neighbor made sense for the amount we were doing at the prices the lasers were at the time. However, if I were doing it again today, I might think about doing the laser because it would allow me to do things I couldn't do otherwise. And that's where I would really look into it and say, what's the utility? What's the cost versus what can I get back out of it? And it is faster than hand cutting if you're doing hand cutting on certain kinds of materials. Because so I had materials that didn't cut well, even when I had glue trap, even when I had the whole setup where I, a properly tuned laser might have been the way to handle some of these weird texture materials I wanted to use for uh, applique. So it really depends. So it's one of those things there. And let's uh, jump on this real quick. Regina says, I've used a Cricut sticky pad on my rolling cutter. I've heard that. I've heard that. So yeah, the, the sticky tray can sometimes be helpful, but having the full table set up kind of like the eye line might be the most stable thing I've seen so far. And uh, Mike says, legit one of my low key goals. I think that's making me laugh on camera, which you know what? It's, it's not that hard guys. I'm already halfway there. <laughs> Jeff says they have registration marks that you can use on vinyl. You can use it to line up, cut things. Yeah. And what I'm going to say is the higher end cutters will also have things like if you do print and cut, we can print registration marks uh, on your material if you're printing. And I'm actually going to show you a little bit about sublimating materials using sublimation printing and heat press before you cut them. I did a lot of that work and I actually can't show you, I don't have samples for everything to show you, but I will talk to you a little bit about one of the things I did in that realm. But some of the cutters, you can print registration marks and there is computer vision. It has a camera on the cutter, which will find the registration marks and then be able to cut lines and line it up well. I will say without that, if you are very careful about your setup, you can still cut things and print them. In fact, what I used to do is pre-cut sheets with a bleed and print a pattern where I lined up these pre-cut areas that were easy. I used registration marks to line up my, my um, sublimation prints and had a bleed on the edge of my sublimation prints so I could print the material post-cutting. So I would actually do all my cuts first. So I had white polyester material with the cuts done lay on my sublimation uh, my sublimation transfer paper that I had made some marks on it so I could line that up with the eventual cut pieces that needed to be printed and then I would press and print. So that is something else that you know I am going to talk about briefly is sublimation because there's a couple different ways that sublimation plays into applique. The other thing I want to tell you guys about is tear away, rip away applique and that uses heat press materials. If you're somebody who is a heat press, a vinyl printer, somebody who uses heat press materials of any kind, whether that's standard heat press vinyl or the one that I'm going to show you, which is glitter flake, uh, you can use that without cutting at all, especially if you have a full bleed image, something where the precision is not that in interesting. If the pattern is interesting, you can use that or solid colors. You can drop that over an outline. You do a placement outline you would, like you would do with standard applique, and then you run satin stitches around it, tear away the excess and heat press it, because otherwise it could still tear out the parts that you want to keep. You tear away all your excess, you heat press it, and you end up with something that looks a great deal like applique, but doesn't require pre-cutting. So there's the three kinds of applique I'm kind of 
throwing around here. Conventional applique where we have applied materials like the uh, like the twill, the polyester twill. And then we have the reverse applique. Like I said, I didn't get a sample that I could show you just yet. And I may try and do that on the fly at the end of the show. Uh, but that's where we cut away the material and reveal something underneath it. And then the other one is kind of a faux applique, which is the uh, tear away applique, rip away applique, which is done with a heat press material that you take off the carrier sheet, lay down, stitch around, and then you can tear away the outside edge, right? It's something you can do, tear away the excess areas and heat press it on, and it looks very much like applique without the pre-cutting step. So that's pretty pretty a cool way we can handle that stuff. So, and print and cut is one of those things that we can do, like I said, with printers, but we don't always have to handle it that way. There's multiple ways we can do this. And Heidi's correct, yeah, this also goes with cut work, embroidery, stuff like that. There are all different things that we can do to apply material after the fact. Another thing that I've done is uh, quilted work, which is a hand hand done piece. Uh, I did some art pieces where uh, actually my, my own mother, who was, knows how to sew very well and who tunes into the show sometimes, she did this really cool work that we did for exhibition where we essentially took a screen printed piece and she put it together with uh, polyfill, stitched it down on an, on the back of a jacket, and followed lines in the artwork to do quilting over batting with a printed piece. She did that manually, and then I ran embroidered elements on top of it. So there are all kinds of cool things you do with applique. Applique is not just one thing, and the thing is, depending on what you're doing and how you're charging for it, there are multiple ways to make this work. But with that, let's go ahead and jump back over to the kind of things I wanted to show you real quick, and let's just discuss a little bit about what's there and different methods and how we can make applique work for us. So here is the actual article that I started with on this one. Now, only halfway through the show, right, guys? Uh, but <laughs> applique anyway, and it's five methods for embroiderers to, to do applique. And this is a personal piece that I did with a printed piece of material just to show what I was talking about because I wanted to show people that with the same tools that we use for everything else, you can do simple applique Anything from a home machine to a commercial machine, anything else you want to do, you can do applique simply at home and do samples. The other great thing about this is this piece can scale up. I did this at home as a sample. Uh, show this sample and you can then use this same method. Some of these methods ended up used in other uh, setups for commercial work. You show this sample piece and then I can have other pieces cut. I can have pre-cuts made. I can do what I need to do, though this piece was done as a hand cut applique. And it does have some interesting things, like it's got some overstitching on it. So you see that these are just these rays on this fan with this kind of Japanese motif, where we have the rays on the fan that are stitched over it. I'm a big fan of using overstitching, both the hold down appliques and to add some texture, uh, just add a little bit of visual interest to a big flat applique area. This one's printed, so it didn't really need it as much for me. It was more that I wanted to have a little bit of detail and stitch down this material because this particular piece, I didn't want to use a bunch of heat press uh, adhesive. I wanted to see if I could use the uh, full cover edging and the stitching to keep this down and have it be a really light hand. And now it's on a canvas piece. It wasn't all that important that it had a light hand, but the final sampling I did, it was really there meant to have a light hand to it. Uh, so this is this is kind of the thing I'm talking about is that we can do applique in multiple ways. And I'm actually gonna show you the article, but this particular piece, yes, that is a uh, big commercial machine, Eric, working on a little home machine because I wanted to prove. This is something I've done with 3D foam before. And I said, you can do 3D foam on a little tiny home machine do it on a big machine. And as far as digitizers like me are concerned, a lot of the techniques are identical. They are not very different whatsoever. And the entire technique set up for applique really doesn't change too much no matter how you're doing it. Um, we have some basic things we need, right? And see, like I said, here's that faux applique where you're using the glitter flake material. You can see it's got a full coverage and here's some hand cut stuff. So I'm going to go over that in more detail, but we're going to talk about how I got there. The thing is with applique, especially for digitizers, the basis of this really just has to do with a few simple techniques and tools. You need a placement line. You need a line on the garment where it's going to show where the applied material goes. Before we run anything else, there needs to be some sort of line of straight stitches, some sort of indication of where the material goes. Uh, if we're doing something that has a full bleed or a big sheet of material, we might be able to get away with less of this, but usually it's an outline that shows exactly where the applique is going to go. Um, if we're doing a pre-cut setup, then the likelihood is this line should be just inside the full shape of the applique so that when we lay the applique down, all of the stitches are covered out to the edge of the applique itself. If it's pre-cut, it means we're also going to need some sort of vector or cut file that we're going to feed to a machine. We're going to feed either to the plotter cutter or to the laser. They're very similar. So it's not like we really need to worry too much about that aside from format. And the format's gonna depend on what machine you're using and what software you're using to do it. Uh, but we are essentially going to need that same line 
to create our cut piece. The thing is, the line that we use for placement is very similar to the line that we would use for um, hand cutting as well. So that placement line, the line that we need for cutting on a computer that we can convert very frequently from our software, and the line that we need for hand cutting are very similar. So the first thing we have is we have a shape and out toward the edge, not all the way to the edge, but out toward the edge of our finished satin edge or our zigzag edge, whatever we're going to use to cover the edge of the applique, we will have that placement line. So we've got a placement line. We have something for tack down. Uh, tack down is just something that's going to either be the final tack or it's going to just tack down, hold down the material at the edges before we handle our final run. If you're doing something like a full covered satin stitch on a cut piece, you're probably going to do a loose tack down edge run that's going to hold things down in order to run it. When you're doing a pre-cut piece, that's what you're going to do. However, tack down can be uh, replaced by a cut line if you're going to hand cut. And what you're gonna see here is that this is a hand cut piece. Instead of running a tack down, which for me would usually be a nice, nice light open zigzag that's going to hold down the edges underneath my satin stitch, it's going to be narrower than my covered satin stitch, but it is going to be large enough to hold onto those edges. Um, Otherwise, if we're doing a hand cut like this, I'm going to run one or two rows of just straight stitch around the outside edge. I want at least two rows of it. I like it to be double thickness because I want a nice heavy edge to lean against. If you see the kind of scissors I'm using, this is a, a traditional applique scissor. These flat build scissors allow you to get an incredibly close cut. But the way they do this is by pressing down that big flat applique bill against the garment and getting it in between the garment and the applique material. And you grab that edge of that scissor, that big flat bill and push it up against that cut line that we've made with our stitching. And it rides along the edge and the top just kind of scrapes along cutting away the edge of the applique. And we get this incredibly tight cut that we can do with handwork. So honestly, it's very similar to anything else we would do. If we're doing pre-cut though, we would put our placement line down, we'd go ahead and grab our pre-cut material, line it up exactly how it's supposed to be, usually with some sort of light adhesive. If it's something like that pressure sensitive poly tool, the reason it says PS or pressure sensitive is it already has a sticker kind of backing to it. It's not what's gonna permanently adhere it to the garment, but it is a light adhesive to adhere it in the hoop while we get things ready. If we do a pre-cut, we're gonna run that line. We're gonna go ahead and adhere it down if it's a pre-cut piece. And then we're gonna run our tack down, our light zigzag edging or whatever we are using to tack it down before our final stitching. And we're also gonna kind of confirm that our placement is the way it should be. Uh, usually it should be good. The reason you use something really light sometimes for tack down, especially if we're gonna do full coverage, is that this is your last chance if something goes wrong, especially using a material that's hard to replace, to um, change the placement, snip out the stitches and move it if you absolutely had to. Uh, usually, if you're doing your stuff right, you've got a little bit of adhesive on it so you can get it to stay where it's supposed to stay, uh, whichever star of embroidery specific adhesive you like, and you are being careful about your placement, you're usually not going to have too much trouble with it going off the rails that far. And if you're doing full satin edge coverage or full edge coverage of some kind on this edge, then you're going to end up with a coverage that has a little bit of slop in it. If you move a little bit, not a, not a lot, more than a millimeter, you're probably gonna have a problem, but within a millimeter, you move a little bit, the likelihood is it will still hit the edge and be covered entirely. So we don't have to worry quite as much about that as long as we're careful with our placement. The thing is, all of these methods look very similar in the end, especially when we're talking about full satin edge coverage stuff. So mostly what I wanted to go through with this is to say that there are multiple methods to handle this. And this is actually another one I wanna show you. This is something I wouldn't do. And I actually advised against this when I saw this guy doing this the first time. Great guy, RJ Silva, that I talked about, did these incredible things that were made for uh, mini truckers, right? Mini truckers, car guys who have a lot of awesome, you know, kind of gear that they wear. They spend money on their clothes because they're in car clubs that have logos. And he was doing it specifically for this niche market. The thing is, when he started out, he was doing it all like this. He was taking his materials, sandwiching them ahead of time, running straight stitch, and then cutting them by hand with, a, with an X-Acto blade, with a knife. Now, he did eventually move the laser. I'm gonna tell you this, he did eventually move the laser. However, this incredibly fine looking edge, this incredible cut done on a non-standard material, something that wasn't going to be very easy to handle with the plotter cutter, was done in that fashion. And because we had a customer who was willing to pay for the ultimate in custom gear with their logo that was on expensive garments that was done in a boutique fashion by hand, he was making money making these jackets. So any of these methods can be viable, 
provided we're charging for them and people understand what we're doing. And that's just one of those things you have to think about is that what makes it viable for you. And like I said, for me, one of the ways I did a lot of hand cut is to do sampling so I could prove, you know, case in point, say, yes, this is the kind of thing I'm trying to do with this material before I go trying to mount the material on something, trying to get it into a cutter, trying to play with it, trying to dial in settings. I know that I can just make a piece to show to a customer and say, these are the kind of things I'm trying to do or to have a piece in my sample kit so that I can say to a customer, this is what I'm going to do and have it outsourced to somebody who does that cutting for me. And here's the actual article that I'm going to show you from Printware itself is back in the day. And it shows some other options. There's some also some hand cut stuff done on hats. I've done similar stuff too. I've done everything from um, felt applique to standard twill to, you know, custom materials on that plotter cutter and done this on hats too. It doesn't change that much for hats aside from the same things we have to worry about with hats all the time, seemingly like attaching patches, that we work from the center out and that we marry the hat with stitching to the stabilizer before we start stitching edges and, and setting things up. Um, but once again, hats shift a lot more, so it is something where you might see more issues with it. But as you can see, placement stitch, the cut line, you hand cut it, and then you do the final stitching on top. It really isn't much different uh, when we're doing it by hand as when we're doing cut pieces. And that's something that I just wanted to show everybody and say, this is these options are all available to you. Um, and, and really, you can make them what you want to make of them. And actually, because we talked about this briefly, and actually we've seen this really uh, recently, um, I wanted to bring up something else that's cool. Jeff says that he did a Sashiko piece, cool piece using this uh, Sashiko stitch, actually Sashiko Stitch from uh, in Brilliance from Stitch Artist. Uh, and he said the last piece he did, I had to cut and redo the placement five times before it was straight. Definitely a process. Yeah, it depends on the kind of material you're working working with. It can be a process, can be difficult. And I actually did a piece where I recapitulated that fan piece and made one for a family member after they had seen it, uh, where I did a cloud the, the pattern is called clouds, I believe, a uh, Sashiko piece with a traditional kind of pattern on top of it, um, done in light stitching below that initial fan piece. So like I said, it, it is something you can do creatively. You can do something pretty awesome with it. And I would say that there are multiple ways that we can handle it, certainly. But um, using a motif stitch on top of it is one of the ways that we can add texture and we can hold down materials that are uh, otherwise difficult to get fused. A lot of people use some sort of heat uh, some heat sensitive fusible materials of some kind is frequently used to handle materials that are not made for it. They don't already have something applied. Um, people will do that. And I think it is useful because honestly, when you put it, put this embroidery down, sometimes you're going to find that that edge is not going to hold all materials equally. Uh, things that are easily frayed, a lot of woven materials will not hold as well uh, unless they've been pre-treated or pre-fused to some sort of fusible adhesive layer. It depends on what you're working with. If you're going to do something that doesn't fuse well to that, like I said, uh, one of the cool pieces I saw RJ do was done with Mexican Serape material. And it just absolutely was thick, coarse, crazy, hard to contain, hard to cut. That's one of those things where um, it was sandwiched with a clear layer on top of it and absolutely had to have a full coverage edge on it and was not really going to heat press in a great way. It was not adhering, I think, when he was working with it. And I've seen that on other materials. So really that that's gonna, the technical nature of the fabric is going to kind of lay out a little bit of what you can do and can't do. But like I said, there are multiple ways to go about this. And here's where I'm going to get Aaron excited. Aaron earlier jumped on and said, sublimation, and perked up his ears. Aaron, if you don't know, and what he does, he does a lot of sublimation printing, and he has been in the sublimation industry for some time. Well, I'm going to show you another way that I handled applique that is interesting. And this was with glitter flake film. And we're just going to go ahead and bring this up. This is another way where if you don't have any cutting material at all, you can do this. And you can do this with solid colors. But I did something a little different because I had a heat press and a desktop sublimation printer at the ready. So if you have that, you might not, then you can do something like this. And this was me using glitter flake film. And I've got this in Images Magazine. I've taught this more than, more than in Images, but I'm just gonna show this to you quickly. This is kind of the almost finished stage, but you can see what I'm working with here. This was a white polyester glitter flake fill or glitter flake film that I heat pressed with sublimation, because sublimation, as we know, it causes dyes to migrate into polyester surfaces. Uh, sublimation is a heat printing process. You print these with, you know, essentially inkjet printers. You layer your transfer onto the polyester material. You can heat press it. People do it on polyester shirts and polyester goods or polyester coated goods all the time. 
So it takes heat and pressure. If you haven't seen it, check out sublimation, something that I know is now becoming available more in the craft market uh, and more and more people are doing it. But let's go ahead and show you what this really is, right? This is my case study. I did a hashtag ABQ, as you guys know, Albuquerque proud of here. I've been, I'm, I am from Albuquerque natively. I live in Albuquerque now. Uh, and this is a an image from the Balloon Fiesta, which uh, sadly, of course, wasn't happening this year. But the Balloon Fiesta is a major event that really is the way we <laughs> kind of mark our years to some degree in Albuquerque, sometimes because of the traffic, sometimes because there's thousands and thousands of balloons in the air. But let's I digress. Let's talk about what I did here. Number one, yes, that is a glitter sweatshirt with glitter flake on it. Uh, never let it be said that I won't do something thoroughly sparkly if someone asks me to do it, because I will. <laughs> I will kill it with sparkle. But here's the thing. All we had to do with this, we only needed our embroidery machine and the heat press to really make this happen because the sublimation transfers is another thing you can be uh, ordering from someone who prints them. There are people out there who will print you sublimation transfers you can use. So if you have a heat press, and you have an embroidery machine, you can do this. And if you aren't doing the printing, you can do this with just your embroidery machine and the heat press to secure your heat press material. So this one, super easy, doesn't require cut files at all. All we're going to do is have a design that like, as you see here, has big open spaces where it makes sense for a print to show through. That's also applique in general. We're trying to cover big spaces with it. It's something that we're trying to do uh, is to obliterate big areas of fill. That's something we're using applique for. We're filling in those areas with the applique material because it's less uh, hassle than stitches, has nice big thick coverage and provides us with a uh, absolutely zero show through without all the time spent on thousand stitches. We can talk about time savings on this briefly, but suffice to say, this is what we're doing with this glitter flake applique. And what you can see with this is to celebrate this, I essentially did this piece. To celebrate the Lone Fiesta, you can see this here. Um, Full sparkle shirt, and this is the final look. This was done also with metallic thread. You don't have to do that, and some of my other pieces were not done. But this is essentially how it was done. First, I did some uh, some style designs for you to check out here. These were all just concept designs. I actually did produce the one that had the chilies in it. I didn't produce the Sandy Mountains one, which I had, might still do someday. But these are the two that I was working out. Essentially, I wanted something that had a nice big thick outline. This is our applique stitch. If we were doing those conventional applique, we would want that big three millimeter plus three to five millimeter satin stitch is really great for these big appliques that we're doing full pieces like this. Um, can you do thinner stitches? Yes, you got to watch out for having enough material under your cover stitch to not tear away or fringe out or cause any sort of fraying. But this is the first thing is to look for some a, a sort of design where the background shows through and is really excellently visible. I like this uh, this sort of thing. Big, thick lettering is a great way to handle it. Big collegiate lettering, big, thick, bold lettering like this absolutely looks great for this type of uh, this type of work. Also great for reverse applique. Same kind of thing. When you want to cut something out and have something show through, big, bold areas like this are great for that. So the next thing that I did, essentially, I removed the glitter flake material from the carrier sheet. There was originally a carrier sheet there that was uh, for cutting. So if I was going to run it through and cut it on a plotter cutter, removed that and put this on a silicone mat so that it, or a silicone sheet so that it would not stick to anything. And I sandwiched it together with my prints. And these were full bleed prints. I used prints that went outside of the area of the design so that if I shifted a little bit in my application, it wouldn't matter too much because the print is a full bleed print and nothing has to line up exactly. Uh, with things that you have to uh, do exact lineups, you may have to do things like registration marks or something else or something to help you align it to the piece. Uh, you might also have the bleed be less than this. For this one, I went ahead and did full bleed. If I were doing this in mass production, I probably would have tightened this up for some savings on ink long term. So this is what I what I like to see. This is what we essentially did. Um, went ahead and ran this uh, sublimation material onto this glitter flake. And as you can see, once it's pressed, this is what it looks like. I had these full bleed swatches that were made larger than the size of the finished design, right? These are the three pieces that I did on that white polyester glitter flake material. Uh, as you can see, ran a placement line. This is actually me doing the Chili's piece, which did, did also get produced. Nice sweatshirt. You run a placement line, which is just the same kind of placement line you use for any kind of applique, and you lay down this full bleed. Like I said, this could have a tighter print. You wouldn't have to use all this ink. I went ahead and did the full bleed because I didn't want to mess around with it, and the ink costs were nowhere uh, near enough for me to be less concerned about that than I was about accidental shifting in placement. Uh, that's something that's one of those production things. I know it's more likely that a little bit of shifting would cause problems than I'm going to save with an ink cost. Ruin one sweatshirt and now that ink cost is very minimal. So definitely 
use the full bleed if you're doing something like this, in my opinion. After that, you go ahead and stitch down the overall design. It's stitching all the border out. I probably should stitch the border second, but this time I stitch the border first and then the interior pieces that cover up like the counters and the lettering. And at the end, you tear it away and that's it. You tear away the outside edges, you tear away the voids, and then you hit it with the heat press with the same uh, sort of material settings that you would use to adhere this film, this glitter flake, to the garment. They're gonna be specified by your vendor. They're gonna talk about that anyway. And really that's all it is. When you grab this, you grab it and you tear it away. That's all you have to do. In fact, I think I showed that in the in my original brand image for this. And I'll actually bring this up because we have a couple different things there on here that are interesting. You can see me here in the center of the screen uh, tearing that away just with my hands. That's all you have to do. It perforates enough that you can tear it away with your hands. It doesn't really need to be more than that. And actually, another thing I'll show you while we're looking at this stuff on screen, up here, right next to the P and take up, that's the reverse hand cut applique piece I wanted to show you that for some reason got closed in my tabs right before the show. I had a little uh, hiccup with the computer right before we got going. Um, but when I got my tabs back up, I lost this one. But that's that hand cut applique. I, I did that same thing. It's a piece, two pieces of of uh, essentially jersey knit. I did a t-shirt and there's a piece of jersey knit underneath it in the contrasting color, ran the stitching on top and cut it away. And this was a rough cut distressed applique by design. So anyway, with the, with the faux applique, you can see all you really have to do is tear it away, heat press it so that it's adhered. And it is something that is incredibly useful, looks great like applique. And I'll even say a uh, glitter flake is cool, but even standard applique vinyl you would use for printing, for some reason, just our heads are so set to understand applied material as something that's on top of the garment that if you use even a standard texture, regular vinyl, when the, you see the applique stitching around it and you heat press it, your brain wants to tell you it's leather. Like if you use leather tone stuff, it's a leather or a faux leather or something like that. It looks more like a leather applique than it looks like a print with stitching around it. For some reason, it's just your brain kind of confuses you into that. If it has a little bit of that shine, it really looks cool. So even a really plain heat press vinyl, I think is a really interesting, cool looking texture that you can work with. With that, I'm gonna stop for just a second and show you guys the meme day, the memes that we didn't do today. We've got more stuff to get to, so we're gonna go into bonus time. But remember, moment of meme, we have to have our little bit of fun every day. And I have a couple about applique to bring in because I think it was uh, worth doing. Number one is this. Average digitizers, yeah, they, they could be using applique, but ooh, four hours of that fill stitch, because boy, it's a lot easier to fill an area by just clicking a couple buttons than it is to set up our applique, right? <laughs> Unfortunately, there's a lot of people where you have a digitizer work on a design that has a big flat slab of area that's colored in it. And especially if you've got vector art for it, they're gonna wanna throw a fill stitch in there with a border on it and they're not gonna wanna think about applique or other kind of materials that we can use for support. So hate to say that this has been the reality with lots of people. I've had people talk to me about why I'm a brand new embroiderer. I wanna do this big jacket back, but it's taken 60 hours and I can't get it done and all this stuff. And I'm like, hey, did you think about doing some applique cuts? Yeah, not always. <laughs> and here's the other one, because I actually have already showed you some of the uh, pictures that I've showed you of my plotter cutter of the tool that I used were actually from my patch article. So this is the other one I put together here, guys. It's like, applique, is this a patch? Not really. <laughs> but at the same time, if you guys have looked at my patch methods where I use, say, a, uh, a waste material of some kind, whether it's the plastic patch method or if the one that I usually like to use, which is the water soluble method, where we apply a piece of twill down, we stitch our borders on it, and then we melt away somehow the background material. Yeah, that's a lot like applique, the technique behind it, aside from maybe some reinforcement to make patch edges look a little different or act a little different. Yeah, it's kind of the same material. It's kind of the same thing. So don't tell anybody. It's kind of like making patches. Also, if you need a patch on something, but they're not really tied to the idea that the edge is free and you put your design on the applique material, but then satin stitch the whole edge directly on the garment. Is that an applique or a patch? A little of both. So yeah, yeah. Is this a patch? <laughs> kind of. <laughs> kind of. So, all right, guys. Uh, it's one of those things that I, I have to show you guys. I have to give a little bit of fun in. But applique and patches are very similar. And like applique and patches, you can apply more technology to it if you want to. You can have a laser cutter for patch edging. You can do hot knife by hand if you want to. You can have automatic cutting or hot cutting on the machine if you want to. But you can also use a scissor and some support material and your braiding machine. Patches and applique are very similar in that way. 
also they're just really similar that we put together. I'm gonna bring in a couple more comments for fun here. Uh, number one, I'm gonna agree with Jeff a great deal. We talked about Sachiko earlier. Brian did an amazing job with that Sachiko stitch. Absolutely, his programmatic stitches are very cool. And you know, it's something you may see more of, and especially for me, because I wanna play around with it. After seeing uh, Jeff's piece, it made me wanna resurrect. I have a bunch of Sachiko pattern stuff I did back in the day, I would love to do more. Uh, Mike says, I like that one. Yeah, I like that one too. I like those memes. Memes are fun. I mean, sometimes they're not the best. We've, sometimes there's some static over memes out there, but you know, they're dorky and these are inside baseball for people who are doing embroidery. You know, it is just an inside joke for us. It's something that no one else will think is funny. Don't show your spouse, significant other, brother, friend, these things, because they will not be funny to anybody who's not doing embroidery. <laughs> that is just the way it is, guys. But anyway, let's go ahead and get back a little bit to what we were talking about with applique. I'm going to show you some more things while we're going through this. So we've shown you the faux applique. I've shown you hand cut applique and really, Here's one of the other things I think is interesting. Uh, I talked to you guys about using uh, sublimation printing. This is also sublimation printing done on polyester twill. Now this one looks a little washed out because it's a little shiny. And this is the problem with using, uh, some twills are shinier. You're going to find that uh, not everybody likes the shine. You may have to go for different kinds of twill to get different finish qualities. But this is something that previously, there wasn't a lot of pre-printed material that I could use with my cutter back in the day. So I used sublimation on polyester twill, um, that specifically that roll-fed polyester twill to create my own patterns. And the reason this was interesting, not because plaid is all that hard to come by, but be this is what we eventually ended up with. At the time, Argyle was really big. However, you can use this to do anything. This could be the same thing that I just showed you with the balloon fiesta stuff. If you wanted a more robust applique that has, let's say, a field of corporate logos done in an all over pattern that has the colors from a team that are not very common, you're not going to find them in any given store. These things can be achieved through using either prints or using sublimation to do custom prints. And this is something, once again, from Images Magazine, they're getting a little free advertisement there. But this was done essentially by pre-cutting these pieces and then using sublimation to do a bleed print over these pieces and then weeding away the excess material. So once again, something interesting you can do, combining sublimation with polyester material, which is very classic for applique, can allow you to do some cool pre-printed stuff that is easy to put on your uh, materials. It's a great sample. And I've got a couple other applique pieces here. I'm going to show you more of these. This is another traditional one. One of my first applique pieces that I did, and this one was uh, for a racing company called Desert Dogs. And most of this is applique. As you can see, we've got three colors of applique. However, this one is uh, deceitful. It looks like it's going to be a kiss cut multi-layer. Uh, there's actually no multiple layers in it. I'll actually show you the sample again. I think I've got another picture of this guy. But this one was done with stitches on top. And what you can see is I've got some stitch carving here. I've got some satin stitches that are overlapped in the teeth. So I'm getting texture here, just like I would get from standard embroidery. However, the main body of the wolf's face or the desert dog here, the dog's face, the background behind it and this ring that actually has text in it are all done in solid applique. I've done a good job of matching my tongue color to this applique here. However, this is all done in fill. So I'm having the best of both worlds. I have a full color coverage for this really big piece. This thing is about like 16 inches across on the back of a jacket. It's huge. This piece is largely done in applique because to fill it would have been hours and hours and hours and hours of stitching. However, doing this in applique, I actually cut these things out where there are voids in them. It's actually one layer of applique has a really light hand. So it, it, it is on a denim jacket here, but it can be run on a satin jacket without it being too crazy, too heavy because I only actually have one layer of polyester. And the stitching, though there is some fairly good dense stitching that's going on here in the tongue and in the teeth, uh, the teeth are definitely reduced because we've got a very low... Um, kind of contrast between the gray and the white of the teeth. So there's not a lot of density in here, more density in the black, more density in the red, but very carefully handled with some structural underlay. And we've got some other interesting stuff here. The fill that's in the nose is actually with a randomized fill pattern. Using the randomized fill pattern makes it organic. So here I've got carved teeth with the satin stitches. It gives it shine, gives it some dimension, even though the original art was very flat here. I've got some organic looking fill stitch for the nose so that it looks textured, it looks organic, but it's still really simple, really fast to do and had a lot of visual interest even though I'm using applique. And one of the other ones, and I'm gonna show it to you more than once, is that I'd like to show is this FDNY piece. This is not the best image. Hopefully I've got another image to show you on this one. Um, this was done uh, back, like I said, in the, in the days where I was doing the official FDNY stuff. 
Um, and this is done with just this very small smattering of contour stitches, contour stitches because of the nature of having the same number of rows in the wider area of the column as the thinner area gives you this kind of gradient look just because of how close the lines are together. We're essentially uh, leveraging density to make this happen. And so what we have with this piece, we've got this contour stitching in the flames and we get these overlaps, we get this shading, what I'm gonna say for free. Each one of these tongues in the flame is one column, one two-sided column. And as you can see, it gets tighter where the lines are close together, gets looser where they're open. Now, depending on the kind of contour you have in your software, there are multiple contours. Some are made to where they even out the density. If you're using the one where it just uses the same number of lines, you get this kind of coloration and stitching for free. And what I'm gonna tell you is, and what I mean for free is without having to make it manually without having to work on it. What I'm gonna tell you is it does not add a significant amount of stitch count to this overall design, but it does add a lot of uh, a lot of visual texture and a little bit of tension, and it adds something to the overall presentation, even though this is one color of thread. This is one red over one solid block of gold applique. That's all it is, standard, shiny, Stahl's PS Poly Twill with some stitching on top of it. So with that stitching on top of it, it makes it look a lot more interesting. And here's something, once again, you could do this hand cut. You could do this in just about any software on earth. This is not something that is incredibly difficult or hard to do. It would be easier if you've got tools that are nice, if you've got good contours. I know a stitch artist has awesome, has both kinds of contours. You could mess with which one you use if you want even density versus the kind of uh, gradient look that we're getting here. But this is something that's very simple to do no matter who you are, no matter what equipment you have. So I love to show you this kind of stuff because I think it is really interesting. It's, it's something that is worth looking at. Uh, let's go ahead and look at a couple of other options. We have this, we'll just show you this quicker. This is a little bit closer look at it. So hopefully you can kind of get a look at how that was done. Like I said, standard contour stitch in here and I'll go ahead and blow this up. We'll give that the full screen so you can see it a little better. Um, not a ton, but there you go. Uh, and let's see, we can probably open this image in another tab and take a look at it. There we are. So we do have the same kind of contour stitching as you can see where these overlap. Certainly there's pathing done so that I'm not traveling over the top of it or having excess runs. One of the great things is because we're doing applique with as a full satin stitch cover, I can do all of my traveling under the edge of my satin stitch. I can do all of that under the edge in between the elements that are done with that contour. So flames are a great study to mess around with contour stitches. They look fantastic. Another great thing is flower petals are great for it uh, because you get that kind of extra detail, like I said, for free without having to think about it or work on it very much. So something that's really cool to do with applique is add some overstitching. I think that it's a worthwhile enterprise to try it out because it does make big flat areas of applique more interesting. A uh, couple other things, like I said, I'm going to show you this one more time. I actually just got a better image of this. Um, when you're doing really big pieces, being able to parse things out, it really does help to uh, think about things ahead of time, use big pieces of applique, use these to do the big fills. It just gives you another look at the kind of tongue, teeth, and face. I will say for my money, the one thing I don't love about this piece is that the stitching in the mouth sitting on top of the grade looks a little high. It looks like it's far forward. But I would say for the overall cost of doing this piece, uh, looks great, turned out great, and was something I would do again, even though it's an early piece of mine. And the other thing I will say, uh, some of these designs I've done, like this piece here, here's one where I did it all in fill for a jacket back because they demanded it. Uh, let me tell you what, next time we ran it, that green in the background was a big old applique because <laughs> it just saves stitches ultimately. But here's the piece that I actually thought was much more interesting to show you. And this was something that I had to do for a local salsa company who was doing a run of gifts and they did something quick. They needed to have giant jacket backs done fast. Now, yes, there are uh, there are still things you have to do that may applicate difficult. Hand placement, sticking things down, potentially heat pressing it. These are costs, but when you come up with a really, truly huge piece of full coverage area, generally you're having less cost overall if you're cutting applique and running that down, especially if it's something you're set up to do. Um, we can talk about how much time it takes to do all of these individual setups. The thing is they aren't on the machine. And if the machine has more throughput during the time that those things are off the machine, then you're not losing that time. You're just also having stitching going on at the same time using other equipment. However, however, I will show you this. This is something that's more interesting artistically and because it solved a problem. Uh, this particular piece, like I said, the Salsa Company had a logo that has a cool little lizard on it, right? It has a chameleon. And this particular piece, I had to do very quickly. They wanted something done quickly within a couple of days 
for a group of people who are getting these big gifts for the launch of the salsa company. And they had this lizard on them and they wanted to blow their logo up huge for a jacket back, but we really didn't have a lot of visual interest there. And it had a bunch of gradients in it. It had some texture in it. Could I have digitized it? Yes, I could. By the time I filled it and did all the work on it, it would have been a tremendous number of stitches and it would have taken me hours and hours and hours. We had a couple days. So what we elected to do is we used specialty material. We used a material that had a reptile print in it. And this is rubbery. It has texture. It is not easy to work with. This is something that I stuck to a, a masking film like I talked about earlier. If I had this to do again, um, if it could be done on laser without being dangerous, it might be because the fumes from this were probably nasty, or I would definitely have done this on a big flat sticky tray like the IO Lion 300 would have been better, but I used what I had. And what I had was a big roll of backing film, that magic mask, and I had this material, which was actually upholstery material. Very rubbery, has a slight woven background to it that doesn't stick well to the magic mask, but it worked all right. And this is something where I had to cut over the lines twice, where I had to leave myself big, thick borders for slop because it was incredibly stretchy and underneath these stresses of embroidery, this stuff wanted to move around a lot. However, managed to make my couple dozen of these, of these pieces uh, successfully, and they were very well loved by the people who use them. So what I will show you about that is that we get all of this texture and it's something that I, I cannot recommend enough. Using textured materials can absolutely add something incredibly interesting to these pieces. So um, <laughs> this is, sorry, I had to laugh at this. Um, Mike says, I just tried to close that images magazine. I had to see better. Sorry about that. I closed it for you. I need to, when I put an ad blocker on, on that one, I mean, I hate to do the ad blocker on images, but guys, it also kills the images. It kills all the pictures that are on there. So I can't use an ad blocker, but let's go ahead and bring this up. I'm going to try and show this to you guys one more time. I'll show you the individual images once more, uh, because it is something that is interesting. This is a combination of traditional applique. So let's go ahead and grab this up and I'll show it to you. The background that's in here, it's inside the, the logo area that has the text on it. I've got it blocked out so you can't see it. However, this background here is traditional twill applique that matched the kind of uh, colors that were already in, in the design. The other thing I'm gonna tell you about this, and this is a cheaty thing that you don't hear me say often, the initial design was resized from a left chest. You'll never hear me admit this anywhere else. Doing this quickly, I resized the initial design because I looked at what was there and with minor editing, I was able to repair things that needed to be repaired in this design and run these things overnight. Like I said, with a couple dozen of them and two days to work in, I had to leave most of the time for once the approval was done for actually getting them done on the machine. We're within a couple of days, within one production week that had to be done. Um, this is one of those things that I, I don't do frequently, but I managed to get these things in there and replace a couple of the text elements, uh, do a filled bordered uh, text in here from the original art instead of using the satin stitch text that was originally in the middle of the left chest design. And I was able to get a lot of visual interest. And once again, what are we done here? We're combining things to make the most sense. The background inside of the text box is traditional polyester uh, uh, polyester applique, just polyester twill, cut on a plotter cutter. This stuff was already mounted, very easy to cut. The background inside of this word salsa here is done in a fill stitch. Luckily, because I don't have a lot behind it, I didn't have to use a ton of coverage. I didn't use to have to use a ton of um, density because there isn't the rest of the material behind it. The material actually stops in here. So we are over black and the, the contrast is not too super high so I can drop down my densities. I do have nice big satin stitch borders on everything so that I can account for all the stretch and the strain that's in the material. The last thing you're gonna see too, this big piece, I did not cut out a little curly Q tail for it. Um, I elected to do satin stitch on top of the curly Q tail to fill it in so that the applique piece was one big unit that covered this area here. It does have a little bit of a thin strip here and that's not great for applique because when applique goes wrong, it's because you have a stretchy area that's going to turn, twist, stretch, move while it's running. Uh, that's the worst. If you have really thin piece of material, then you need to adhere this thing down. And this material defied being adhered with adhesives because of the way it was created. Not every material is equally great for applique, but even with it stretching and stuff like that, having the extra border here, having a well underlaid big satin stitch that was going to hold everything down and cover the edges. And rather than running a little curly cue that was going to stretch and squirrel around, I actually elected to fill in this area with an extra satin stitch and border it so that I had one 
continuous slab of applique material here so it didn't squirrel around and move too much and try and get out of shape. So these are things that you have to learn about applique, but what I'm gonna say is, didn't take a laser bridge, didn't take extra equipment, didn't require me to do a lot of extra planning. All I really had to do that was different for this is provide a cut file that was in the shape of the area I wanted cut. And the thing is, you may not even have to do that depending on what you're doing. And I'll talk about that again in a minute here when we get into the end of bonus time. One of the other great reasons to use applique, you guys have seen this before. If you've seen the earlier episode where I talk about dealing with disaster embroidery, there's another great one in here. I'll go ahead and let's close that image ahead of time before I show you anything. This is what the customer brought me. Uh, and yes, it looked exactly like this. That design is a crater. That fill is complete on a chambray shirt or a light denim shirt. Uh, and this is absolutely bunched up like somebody took a fist around it and smashed it together. But when we wanted to replace this, I actually took some cues. We had Regina in the comments earlier. Uh, her applique work that she did is part of the reason I, I thought about this. We're on performance material. So I took this thing that bunched up a denim shirt and I did the same size, same coverage on performance material. How did I manage that? Well, the blue inside of this Duke City logo is a big slab of polyester twill with a, I believe it's a less than 50% infill on top of it. It has all the texture of an embroidered piece, or at least a lot of that texture. It's enough to uh, let the client believe it's fully embroidered because they wanted a fully embroidered circle. And I explained to them what I was going to do. And once they saw the sample, good to go. Uh, the thing is, look at the, the lack of puckering on this, which is an absolutely light gossamer piece. It's a gossamer, light, very uh, stretchy wicking polo shirt. Using the applique gave me a stable basis and gave me color coverage without having to worry too much about it. Plus, as you can see, I was generous to myself, used a nice big wide satin stitch on here so that I didn't have to worry about my edge covering. I absolutely used probably more than I needed. When it's a big slab like this, it does provide a little texture that it has that edge there. Not everybody may like the shine and the shadow along the inside edge, but generally people are not going to complain and they're going to get a really nice finish out of it. So another reason to use applique, not even having to do with necessarily uh, saving stitches. Yes, it is to a degree, but it's to dealing with uh, puckering, dealing with light materials that you don't want to run that much stitching on. Um, if the entire design was in here, and I've actually got another piece to show you like that, you can also run the entire design and applique it on with that final cover stitch on the edge. And that's something where you absolutely could run the entire central material inside of a design cut it with a scissor and then put it down. You wouldn't have to do any sort of specialty cutting because you can run a cut line on the outside of that thing, cut it out from the stabilizer and everything, slap it down on your new piece and stitch it down. And I'll show you a piece like that in a second here. So let's go ahead and pop through a couple other kinds of applique I just thought I'd show you. You don't always have to have a covered fit finished edge either. I did this piece and this is actually in a piece from images where we're talking about uh, extending your brand through workwear. It's a piece I've shown many times to show about, to talk about like specialty stitch treatments, motifs, and uh, and um, actually metallic thread. But what you can see here, I've used this cool whip stitch. It's either a multi-count satin or a whip stitch in uh, Stitch Artist that I used to create this kind of loose, chunky looking like thread treatment. The interesting thing about it is this is a rough cut applique made out of Jersey knit, cut out with a scissor, rough as you please. The thing is when it's distressed on purpose like this, this is still applique. And all I did was cut it to the general diamond shape of the first piece here. I ran all the fills before the gold and cut the edge out before I ran the gold and the rest of the top material. When you're doing a sample like this, it's easy. And even when you're doing the final run, this is the kind of thing where you could absolutely lay this out, cut it with a scissor before you handled it and drop these down over a placement stitch. Because they're rough, because it's uh, distressed, it's not that important <laughs> it's not that important that we have that super clean edge or that we follow the line perfectly. So once again, another way we can use applique is doing rough cut pieces that are intended to curl and have that edge. What you will notice though, is the way that this pattern is put together, the uh, argyle lines that stick out beyond this rough cut applique do hold down the edges of that material somewhat to keep it from curling all the way. So you can still use applique in other ways that don't require precise cutting, don't need a machine at all if you want to. Uh, this is something where, yes, maybe a laser might save me some time, but if I wanted the jagged edge, I'd actually have to program that into the outline that I'm cutting. Uh, so that's something we can look for. Uh, rough cut applique, a cool way to use applique as well, and uh, worked very well with this entire branding package, right? 
So very cool way to use it. Um, another rough cut applique. First time I did a rough cut applique that was successful, really worked out. Same kind of thing here. This is multimedia. It's a flock print that then has uh, laid these letters out, had a placement stitch for each of these letters uh, together, put down a big slab of, of once again, jersey knit on top of it, ran a faux chain stitch on top of it, a faux treated chain stitch motif that I created, and then cut around that roughly with scissors. The thing is, once again, for the right client with the right budget, even hand cuts can be valuable. And when you're doing something like this that's rough cut, it's less time investment than if you were doing precise hand cutting like I showed you earlier with uh, RJ's work for the mini truck community. A couple other things before we finish out here. Here's one of the other options. And this is something that I've done before. You can do this one of two ways, right? A applique can be uh, helpful for dealing with texture as well, right? This particular piece, really fine detailed work inside of this border, very small lettering on a left chest done on kind of a, a medium textured piquet polo. But if you want that really, really fine work, and if you don't want any show through on this white on black with this textured cotton polo, it can help to use applique as kind of a backer and a design element. This particular piece, round cuts. So this is stuff that's super, super easy. You could punch this out with a die if you had them all in standard sizes. But this particular piece, once again, cut on the plotter cutter and plotter cutters these days are rather cheap and easy to come by compared to you know, what they were when I first started. Cut on a plotter cutter, regular circle, nothing more than that, up to the edge of that area. This is heat press material again, however, with this much stitching on it, I don't feel like I would be that continu uh, continually scared of it fringing up or tearing off. I would not be that worried about heat pressing this on because it is stitched down to the inch of its life with a full satin edge cover. Um, this particular piece, there are two ways to handle this. I have seen this done and used this in two different methods. One method, you put down the applique and tack down the edge before you do all the rest of the material. Then you stitch everything logo included through the garment. The other option for this one is to stitch all of the material except for the outer edge and stitch a placement edge or a cut line around the edge. Stitch this on a whole material, the uncut twill that's spanned in the hoop. Cut out your individual circles, whichever method that you want to use to cut those out. Then you lay down the full design already stitched on your garment and you only you tack it down just like a normal applique. Cover that edge with the satin stitch and what you end up with is a garment that doesn't have a lot of material on the inside. If you have people who are concerned about logos scratching them up, this is one way to handle that. It is a slightly heavier uh, logo than you would have if you didn't have that stabilizer and everything inside of it. But you do that piece, you cut that out, and you run that satin stitch border on the edge and you have this fully sealed edge that is a patch style, doesn't have the edge flipping away from the garment, doesn't have a lot of uh, stitching through the garment. And it also means that on light garments, you may not have a lot of distortion and the other kind of things that when you have heavy stitching on a light garment and you can just stitch that on after the fact. Also can be used in repairing garments with holes, garments with flaws. Not something I always recommend people do, but when you are doing it or need to do it, especially in the case of a garment that you cannot replace easily, that is another method. So I'm going to go through the last couple tabs that we had here. You guys seen the eye line cutters, one of those options. You've seen the PS Poly twill. Everyone always asks what kind of twill I'm showing you. This is the kind of twill I'm showing you, but a ton of people have twills and any twill is great for that kind of work. And like I said, is it like a patch? Absolutely. The, the method for making this patch is very little different than it is for making anything else. And you can see that that is similar. As you can see, doesn't that look a lot like applique? And what scissor am I using here? I'm using an applique scissor because it made it easy for making that patch blank that I did at the house for as a sample, right? So cutting with a patch, very similar stuff. And here's one other thing I wanted to show you briefly. And this is actually um, something in the distressed line of appliques. I talked about distressed edge appliques. Yes, you can produce them yourself. But there is a host of products like this. And I showed you this one specifically because it's one that I did rather than just show you the product line. This is something Stalls does, but there are other companies that also do it. This one is particularly from Stalls. You can order pre-made pieces that are layered and pre-stitched together. This particular piece of ragged edge applique, we did a ton of these when we were working for Keller Williams when I did a company store for them. And these were all ordered directly from Stalls ready-made. Now, did we lay them out and decide how to work on them. Yes, we did. The The major addition to this particular piece, and this is something you can do with someone who digitizes you or you add text to things, very simple to do. Have someone else produce the rest of it. We had them use their stock font that has this uh, distressing done to it. It comes in a pre-laid out piece that is already layered with the multiple colors. We have a stitch file that only stitches it on. That's all it does. Placement line stitches it down. 
And then I, as the digitizer, ran back in and did custom text underneath it that matched with their corporate logo for the realty that's under the Keller Williams here. The other thing that we can always do with applique is though we can do this stuff ourselves, there are tons of people out there with lasers and cutters. There are servicers like stalls who have things that are either custom cut from your own cut files or they have standard stock fonts and styles that can help you. You go ahead and order this stuff in, bring it in, do the last stage stitching yourself, and you can still add elements of traditional embroidery to these pre-cut appliques. They did not lay out the realty lettering on this. That's something I did to the final files once I was done with it. We ran all the stitching down to stitch this uh, distressed applique on, and then I ran the realty on it as part of that setup. We got this cut files and the stitch files, not the cut files, we got the stitch files in from stalls after they delivered these pre-cut pieces to us that we uh, designed with them on their website. Then I brought it into my software, aligned and set up the realty addition to it. So one of the other things we can do with Applique, even if you're not going to cut it yourself, you have no equipment, all you have is an embroidery machine, you can still order Applique from somewhere else and do it yourself. So these are all things that are useful and I like to show those things, right? That's something that I always like to show is that there always are options. No matter how you do it, like I said, when I call this Applique anyway, the reason I did call it Applique anyway is that there are so many ways to handle it. Whether it's doing the hand cut stuff like this, whether it is doing the faux applique with the heat press materials, or it's classic, or it's hand cut. No matter how you slice it, there is a way to incorporate applique that doesn't require you to necessarily go out and get this material. Now, what I would say is, you want to do something really fine. You want to get into it. You're doing applique all the time. Applique becomes your life. It's constant jerseys. It's constant customs. And you have the market for it by all means, get these, these machines. They're going to increase your automation. They're going to give you a capabilities you wouldn't have otherwise. Having a laser lets you do a lot more than just cut applique. These things can be super useful. Now, maybe not maybe not the big laser bridge. Depends on what your, your market is like. But having a, a desktop laser, having a laser can certainly help like that. You can do these sorts of things. However, you don't necessarily need to, to dip your toes in the water to get applique started. You need to be able to do minor amounts of design work and have software that handles applique at all. And it doesn't even necessarily need digitizing software. Uh, with that, I'm going to show you one last thing technically about applique and then I'll let you guys go. I know it's into bonus time. We've had some people I'm sure who have to drop off because we were almost in an hour and a half. But like I said, I knew this was a huge thing to cover. This is something that I know there's that we're going to probably do again in some more uh, limited but more refined version. But I would like to show you at least one other thing before we get done. And that's something cool uh, from Embrilliance that we do that not everybody else does. And I think it's pretty interesting because everybody's always telling me, okay, I want to do applique and I want to do some custom stuff or I want to do applique, but and I, maybe I have a cutter, but I don't have a digitizing ability or I'm not going to do digitizing. Or I don't know how to do vector, whatever else. This is something to show you that's just cool, right? This is a cut file from a company. I'm not going to tell you whose file this is. This is a stitch file from a company that is made to help you stitch um, pre-cut applique stuff that they hand out, right? So this is them giving you a stitch file for some pre-cut applique pieces they sell, right? This is also the same when you get an applique design from a stock design house. Somebody has an applique lettering design, they have an applique design in general, um, and it may be made for hand cut applique, but let's just say that you are the kind of person who does have a plotter cutter or a laser or something else like that. If you have base level and brilliance, right? We have like uh, essentials. You can find the cut line. As we can see here, we've got an applique position line. Uh, we've got applique line. We have the first line positioning. We have then our tack down. We have our final coverage line here. We look at all these. Well, here's my applique position. The reason it's applique position is I've already played with it. In Embrilliance, we can go ahead and I'll go ahead and full screen this so you can see it a little better. We can grab the color. And when we look at the color here, yes, there's all these color options you have for the thread. But if you click on the applique button here, we can say, okay, this is now, I want to say this is applique position. Well, there's a cutting window here where I can say, okay, I need a cut file. Inflate this by uh, uh, one millimeter or less than a millimeter. Let's say I want to go a little closer to the edge from the placement because it's not that far out, like yeah, 0.6 mils outside of the edge, 0 0.6, 0 0.8 mils, whatever. And we know we want to inflate it a little bit. We and This one, the other thing we can do is say, okay, we want a simulated fabric view to help us see what we're doing. But I can actually say save. When I save this, I'm going to get an SVG file or a PLT file or a studio file or a, S a cut file, plot file. You can have whatever you need to cut this design. And yes, this is not from Vector, 
That's a DST file. This is a stock straight DST file. So let me hide the other layers so you can see what I'm talking about. Um, if I hide this top layer and I hide this middle layer, what we're looking at here, these are stitches. I swear they are to the point where I'm just going to go ahead and show you that's a stitch line. That is not vector. That is stitch line in a DST file. But if we go ahead and check out that color, we go to the applique, I can actually inflate and save out that specific thing. In fact, like I said, I can also put an image behind it, other things like that for a preview. But I can definitely say simulated, and it'll take the color of that and make myself an applique. I say, okay, that's cool. But I can say inflated a certain amount and save it, and I can get myself an SVG file. So the truth of the matter is you don't even necessarily have to have digitizing software to do at least a modicum of custom applique cutting. Um, now, yes, certainly hand cut, you don't need that. But let's say we do have our scan and cut, our Cricut, or our IO line, or our Graph Tech, or our Roland. We can use a DST file that has an outline in it, even maybe one that wasn't originally intended for applique, to create a cut line. Now, there are other ways to say things as vector. Uh, none are as easy as this that I've seen. But you can definitely use that to also draw a vector. I am a big fan of finding a design that has a big block of fill in it that doesn't make sense and then drawing myself a little vector line and uh, running that out. The cool thing is if it had edge run applique on it, I could also break that out and then use the tool from Embrilliance to make that happen. Because back in the day, I used to have to take that bad boy into Corel and draw it myself at scale, which was not always fun. But what I will say is uh, it isn't that hard to get into applique. Uh, if you want to try it, there are different methods to do it. And you definitely can do it at home on your first test machine on a single head with no other tools you can use regular fabrics, you can use more than just what you think you need, but there is something to the scalability and the repeatability you get once you start using cutters. So what I would say is applique, it's awesome. It's worth trying out. There are a lot of things we can do to make it more interesting. It's not always just slabs of color. It's not just to replace a fill, but you can get into it with any sort of toolkit you have and there are viable ways to handle it no matter your market. All right, guys, that is way into bonus time. I know I covered a little too much. I talked a little too fast, but what I will have say is uh, thank you very much, guys, for being here for the FK episode. Thank you for being here for my 50th episode as well. I will try and make it a little tighter. I will say I've had a tough week, had a lot going on on the home front, uh, but I'm glad that I got to make it here for you guys and still discuss this stuff. The cool thing is that there is a lot of options and just like anything else we do in embroidery, um, there are many ways we can handle this. And part of what we can do is expand our skill set, expand our design ethos a little bit to show what is possible. And then go out knowing that there are other options to make this happen, grow our business, grow our usage of our technique, show the samples, like I always tell you guys, show the work you wanna do, make up the samples that spark the imagination of your customers, and then bring it back to production, either by expanding your production line once we already have a market in mind, or by partnering with people to make that more possible, either with our existing equipment or with their equipment. So it's something to look forward to. Um, I will talk more about it. If you guys have topics that you would like me to cover, I would love to hear more about them. If there are specific things you want me to handle, digitizing, uh, if you want me to handle certain kinds of digitizing, if there are projects, there may be some room for some shorter video stuff that I'm looking to do, which may be individual project stuff. I've thought about doing some uh, company logo breakdowns, maybe even some digitizing breakdowns to show you how I handled something uh, specific to kind of the, I always talk about the context in which it was used and why. I thought about doing some of that stuff, kind of doing a, uh, walkthrough of some of the designs I've done before. But if you have techniques, if you have stuff you're struggling with, if you have things you're interested in that you want to talk about, whether it is in the realm of straight digitizing, digitizing and embroidery, e-commerce, anything stitchy or apparel decoration, certainly give me a holler. Go ahead and catch me in the comments, catch me on social media. And I would like to go ahead and say there's last a couple comments they'll bring in because people have been pretty awesome. Uh, first thing, Josh Ellsworth from Stalls. If you haven't seen the, the content from Stalls, Josh is the main presenter there and he does incredible stuff. Now he does a lot more at Stalls than that, but you'll know him as the face on the camera. And he's been doing, honestly, great thing about him. With the pandemic going on, he has been doing decorating from his third bedroom kind of stuff. And he's been showing you professional decoration from a guy who really knows his stuff, who is on the inside of a, a large company, but he, doing it in the back bedroom, doing it himself. And he is showing you awesome content. So he says, congrats on 50 and bringing the quality content. 
Uh, this guy brings quality content. Go check out stuff from Josh. Uh, other thing I'd like to bring in, comment from <laughs> Mike Waldani. Applique is so deceiving. It comes off as the top echelon of decorating, but is faster and less expensive to produce. Definitely my favorite, especially adding those different touches to it. Like I showed you with the FDNY stuff, one color of stitching, one color of applique, very minor layout, and an incredible amount of texture, visual interest, and value. Adding value is great. So everybody, thank you for coming. I'd like for you to try applique out. I'm glad to have you here trying it out. If you do try it, let me know. And like I said, hit me in the comments. Let me know what you want to do. And if you're on YouTube, subscribe, like it, share it with your friends, and let's grow the reciprocator community. Thank you for being here, and I cannot wait to have you back again next Friday.